little else. Truly. I mean, we aren't told about uh, Jesus' first steps. We aren't told about his first words. I mean, so many of us want to know what happens next. What happens next? I mean, but we're really not given that by the gospel writers. We're really not given that. Uh, and yet Matthew, Matthew does give us this story about wise men coming to visit. Even more surprising is that Matthew doesn't include, Matthew doesn't actually include the actual birth of Jesus. He doesn't. You know, in his testimony concerning the life of Jesus, he gives us the, the Jesus genealogy, Joseph being visited by the angel in Matthew chapter 1. We're told that Joseph and Mary, they, they didn't finalize their marriage or consummate their marriage until after Jesus was born. But Matthew doesn't actually tell us any more about the actual birth of Jesus, but he does include this story. He does include this story. And so if you have your Bible with you this morning, I'm going to ask that you open it with me to Matthew chapter 2, the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to go to chapter 2 this morning, and uh, we are going to begin in verse 1. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. We're going to end in verse 12 today. So please follow along as I read the Word of God aloud. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born King of the Jews? For we saw his star at its rising and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed in all Jerusalem with him. So he assembled all the chief priests and scribes of the people and asked them where the Messiah would be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they told him, because this is what was written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, because out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly summoned the wise men and asked them the exact time the star appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. When you find him, report back to me so that I too can go and worship him. After hearing the king, they went on their way, and there it was, the star they had seen at its rising. It led them until it came and stopped above the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overwhelmed with joy. Entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and falling to their knees, they worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their own country by another route. Thanks be to God for his word. So what do we actually know about the wise men? Well, the Greek word that Matthew uses here is magoi, which is translated magi or wise man. This term, it covers a wide variety of men who study dreams and astrology, magic, ancient prophecies, etc. While in today's society, these men might be looked upon with, with a certain skepticism, uh, in that world, these men were more like astronomers. They were priestly men who studied the stars. So, of course, they noticed when a new star appeared brighter than all the rest. They also knew what that star meant. They were from the east, the orient. Uh, not the orient as in China, but the orient as in, as in east. Uh, more, more than likely, they're from Persia. We know that Daniel, along with many Jews were in exile in Babylonia, and so clearly these men were familiar with a prophecy about a king who was to come. These wise men were definitely not Jews, and it's highly likely, though, that they were of Arab descent. Imagine that for just a second. Arabs coming to worship the king of the Jews. 
Tradition has told us that there were three men because there were three gifts given. However, in the scripture here, uh, you can see that, that there is definitely more than one, but we don't know how many. In reality, these men, they would have traveled together in a caravan of their families and servants. So imagine the kind of faith that it would have taken. Imagine the kind of faith to load up all of your stuff, to load up all of your people, your family, your servants, your posse, and begin a trek. You don't know how long you'll be gone, where the destination is, how far you must travel to get to that destination, etc. All you can say when somebody asks about doing this, all you can say is that you saw a star. Now think about that for just a second, okay? I think about my own kids, okay? And I think about all the questions, one after another. Why? 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 I can see it now. Just imagine. Imagine we load up. Why why are we leaving? Because we saw a star. Well, what does that mean? It means the king is here. He is? Yeah, he is. I don't see him. Well, He's not here, but he's in our world. Where? This is where things start to get a little away from you, huh? All right? I I don't know where. Yeah, but where are we going, Dad? Uh, I don't know. We'll know when we get there. Why? I don't know. We just will. I mean, there are a few things that we need to pull out of this story today about in response to the birth of Christ. And the first one is this. I want to see that, that we should fully pursue Jesus in all things. Fully pursue Jesus in all things. Jesus deserves our full pursuit. And that's what the wise men did, right? They loaded up everything, and they're going to be gone. They don't know where they're going, how they're going to get there. They just know they're gone, right? They're fully pursuing. What makes it even crazier is that they did this before they saw any miracles, before they heard Jesus teach, before his death, and before his resurrection, before all of that, they loaded up and came. I'm sure it looked crazy because it is crazy. But just about anything involving God is. It looks crazy to the outsider. It is countercultural, and many times it defies logic and reasoning. That's why we call it miraculous. And that is our God's specialty. That night in Bethlehem, everyone was pursuing something. Everyone was pursuing other things. Outside of the shepherds and some others, everyone was too busy to come. They were too preoccupied to notice. Those who were the closest to the manger were actually the furthest away, spiritually speaking. We've heard this before, those who are near were far away spiritually. Meanwhile, on that same night in Bethlehem, wise men are traveling with all of their possessions. They are a long ways away, but they are pursuing Christ. They are committed. They are all in. They are willing to travel any distance, willing to travel hundreds, maybe thousands of miles. They see the star and they load up. They see the sign in the sky and they're gone. Contrast that for a second with Herod. Herod and his wise guys, if you will. They wouldn't even go five miles five miles. That is all that separated Jerusalem and Bethlehem, five miles in eternity. In John chapter 1, the apostle John, he writes, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was created through him and yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born, not of natural descent or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. He was here. Jesus had come. He was here, and outside of a few faithful people, nobody knew it. They didn't know that the Son of God had been born. 
They didn't know that the Messiah had come. God had come down. The Word became flesh, was dwelling in the barn next door, and they had no idea. The Savior of the world was here, and they missed out on the King. Matthew, he wants us to read this story and and see how some had the opportunity to experience God and some did not because they were otherwise preoccupied. He's writing specifically as a Jew to Jews. And so his gospel is filled with Jewish history and tradition, hence the genealogy in chapter 1 here. But the point is this, is that Jesus isn't a worthy pursuit. Jesus isn't a worthy pursuit. If you talk about faith at your school or your workplace or to your neighbor, or you talk about church to a non-Christian, people often respond with things like, oh, isn't that nice? And man, I'm so happy for you. That's, that's really wonderful. As if Jesus is one of many options. As if Jesus is one of, like, like you could pursue a relationship with God or become an accomplished pianist. That's how the world responds. But Jesus isn't a hobby. He isn't a side project to somehow get right with God. He is the main thing. He is center stage. He is not one of many options. Jesus isn't a worthy pursuit. He's the only pursuit worth pursuing. He is the pursuit of all pursuits. And so if you're a Christian and you would say that Jesus is your Savior and Lord today, then I would remind you today that Jesus deserves our full pursuit God did not come down and be born as a man for us to dabble in Jesus. We don't half pursue God. We fully pursue him with all we got. And so the next thing we need to see today is this, is that we must submit to the king. We must submit to Jesus as king. The wise men, they roll into Jerusalem. Surely that is where the king of the Jews is going to be born, Jerusalem. Jerusalem, that's where the palace is located, but the palace is occupied by another king, a bad king, a terrible king. Nobody, there is nobody like Herod, rightfully so. Herod was power hungry, who exploited everybody for selfish gain. Think of it like this. Caesar demanded a tax of 12.5% on everything. Herod, King Herod, demanded 50%. Now you understand why tax collectors are so hated. They would take 50% for Herod, 125 for Rome, and whatever else on top for themselves. It was like the common man paid 75% in taxes. If Herod perceived you as a threat, he'd just have you killed, which is what he did to much of his own family, his wife, his sons. Even the Roman emperor Caesar Augustus once said it would be be better to be Herod's sow than one of his sons. I tell you this because the wise men, they show up, and they're like, where is the one who's been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we've come to worship him. How do you think Herod, the king, responded? How dare they come into my palace and ask that? I'm the king of the Jews. What are you talking about? You're talking, I mean, you're talking to the king. It says when King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed, I would say so. And all of Jerusalem with him. I mean, I can just imagine how everyone, it says all of Jerusalem with, I mean, everyone in Jerusalem knows how badly this is going to go. Everybody is disturbed. All of Jerusalem knows that crazy Herod is going to take it out on somebody. See, Herod is just as crazy as he is controlling Herod used to dress up as a commoner just to hear what the other people were saying about him. So he calls his his peeps together, and he he asks them, he asks them, he says, he says, all right, tell tell me, guys, tell me, tell me uh, what these guys are talking about. Where is this uh, king to be born? 
and the chief priests and the uh, teachers of the law, who are definitely familiar with the prophecy found in Micah, they say, in Bethlehem of Judea, because that is what was written by the prophet. And so Herod has a secret meeting with the wise men. He tells them to go to Bethlehem. Search carefully for the child. You're going to find him. And when you do, just report back to me everything so I can go and worship him too. You and I both know that's a lie. Herod does not want to worship the child. That's what the wise men want to do. That's not what Herod wants to do. Herod's response may be to pursue Jesus, but it is not in any means for Herod to submit to the Christ child. There's actually three uh, possible responses that Herod could have had, if you think about it. And, And we have these same options. Here are the three different responses that we could have in response to Christ the King. The first one is this, hostility. Hostility. We see this exemplified by King Herod. He's like, no way am I going to bow down to any other. I will not submit to this uh, so-called king. There's contention as to who is the king. Maybe we're not as evil as Herod. We're not even close to doing the deeds that he did. However, I think that there is still some contention among us as to who is the king. There's contention with some as to who is really in control of their life. Who is the king of my life? When people look at my actions, when they look at my words, when they look at the things that I'm involved in, the ways that I spend my time and my talents and my treasures, who's my king? Who gets to call the shots in my life? Sure, you'll always have people who will say, keep your Jesus to yourself, it only causes issues. And these same people, they might get all philosophical, all historical, and refer to all the crimes against humanity that is done in the name of religion. Or maybe it's just better, maybe they'll say that it's just better off to keep the peace. Maybe you had a family gathering like that, where you don't get too Jesus-y around Christmas. It might make for an awkward time. We would hate to have family division. Ultimately, I tend to agree with the great preacher Charles Spurgeon as for the cause of the contention. He says that the great argument against the Bible, and that is our submission to Christ as king, is the ungodly life. I don't want my life to change. I don't want to have to stop sinning. I don't want to have to change my behaviors, and so I will not submit to another master. I'm hostile towards Christ because I'm the king. So the first one is hostility. The second one is this, indifference. Indifference. We see this as a response of the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They know the scriptures, They know the prophecy about the coming of the Messiah. They tell Herod, oh yeah, it's going to be in Bethlehem. And then they sat back and they did nothing. Why didn't they go to Bethlehem? Why didn't they go to see for themselves? The answer is they just didn't care. They were not moved to action. They could have easily said, wow, the Messiah has come to Bethlehem. And, and you, say, you say, you saw a star? Man, that's awesome. We're going to go with you. Nope. They all knew about it, and they chose to do nothing about it. These guys knew all of the right answers, and yet they missed it. I mean, this one may be a little frightening for some because it shows us that it is possible to be religious and yet be spiritually blind. It's possible to go to church and be unchanged by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's possible to read your Bible and know your Bible and yet not be transformed by it. Jesus says to the Jewish leaders in John chapter 5, he says, you pour over the scriptures because you think you have eternal life in them, and yet they testify about me. But you are not willing to come to me so that you may have life. 
There are people who know who Jesus is, but they don't know him. They know facts, they know dates, they know stories and verses, but they have never submitted their life to the will of God. They try to do all of the right things, and yet when it comes to a real movement of the Spirit, when a real movement of the Holy Spirit comes along, they themselves remain unmoved. So there's hostility, and then there's indifference, and then there's surrender. Full submission to the power and authority of the will of God. What does that look like? Worship. It looks like worship. The last thing we need to see today is that Jesus deserves our wholehearted worship. Let's pick back up in verse 9. It says, After hearing the king, they went on their way, and there it was, the star they had seen at its rising. It led them until it came and stopped above the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overwhelmed with joy. Entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and falling to their knees, they worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Seeing the star, seeing the star led them to worship. They were overjoyed. Seeing Christ led them to worship. They bowed down. In an act of worship, they present the king with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Matthew says that they opened their treasures the things that were precious to them. They opened their treasures and presented him with them. Each one, each one a treasure in its own right. Gold, the choicest of metals, certainly meant for the king of kings. Frankincense, the incense of the temple given to the great high priest. And myrrh, the perfume used both to anoint the living and embalm the dead. This same perfume offered to him on this day would be offered to him on the cross. These wise men, they worshiped Jesus and they presented him with their precious gifts. They were indeed, they were indeed treasures and they were indeed costly, but here's the catch. It isn't about the gifts. Sure, these gifts would be a blessing to his family. These gifts, I mean, they're going to flee to Egypt. They're going to need these things as they go along. Mary and Joseph would use these gifts on his behalf and for his benefit. And sure, he deserves any and every gift we could bring. He deserves our greatest treasures. But it isn't about the gift at all. It's about the heart behind the giver and the manner in which the gift was given. These wise men, they traveled an incredibly long distance. They traveled personally to give their treasures. They didn't send it. They wanted to worship the Christ child in person, to behold the newborn king, and to offer up what they treasured. They made the decision that it was better for their treasures to be in the possession of an infant than in their own possession. Their gifts were their worship as they sought to bring glory and honor to the Son of God and not to store up treasures on earth. These men, they came and they bowed down. They had faith to travel the distance that they had traveled. And to be honest, being uh, in front of the Christ child, I'm not sure I'm not sure that they were uh, moved to worship. I know that we would like to think, man, there's a, there's a baby here. I'm moved to worship him because he's Jesus, the, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. All that. I'm not sure that they were moved. My guess is they arrived and they found a baby, a baby with his mother, a baby that didn't look remarkable, he didn't appear exceptional in some way. He wasn't performing miracles yet. He wasn't teaching yet. He couldn't even use complete sentences. But in faith, in faith, they bowed down and worshipped the king. In faith, they chose to worship. 
See, worship is a choice. It isn't dependent on our circumstances or our feelings or even the day of the week. The wise men, they came and they worshipped Jesus even though Jesus had not done anything for them yet. I mean, think about it. He really hadn't done anything yet. They knew he was worthy, and so they worshipped him. In the same way, we too have to make a daily choice to worship. A daily choice to submit wholeheartedly. A daily choice. I mean, even when we are not in the mood to give thanks, to give praise, we do it because he is worthy. It's outside of us. It doesn't matter what I'm going through. It doesn't matter what I'm experiencing. It doesn't matter how I feel. It doesn't matter the mood or the weather or, or even is it Sunday or not. It matters who he is. And he's worthy. See, it wasn't about their gifts. It it wasn't about what they brought to Jesus. It was about their faith and the sacrifices they made in response to that faith. What could we give God that he doesn't already have? God needs nothing, which is good for us because we have nothing to give. Nothing that would suffice, but he deserves it all, and so we give him our all. The Apostle Paul, he writes in Romans 12, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. In response to the awesome reality that Christ has come and that Christ will return, we must wholeheartedly worship. There is no other appropriate response. Jesus came to save us from our sins. As John the Baptist would cry out, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This means that he came to fix our worship, that we might rightly focus, rightly direct our worship to the one who is deserving of it. The Son of God came so that we might have life restored, that all things might be made right. Our Messiah came to make a way where there was no way, that we might be free to worship our Creator. Where relationship had been broken, He came. Where sin had entered the world, He came. Where darkness had been upon the earth, the light of the world came. Where pain and suffering had run rampant, our healer came. Where grief and sorrow ruled, our wonderful counselor came. Where trials and tribulation reigned, the prince of peace came. He is our mighty God, our everlasting father. He is our God with us, our Emmanuel. How can we not worship? How can we not Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks. We praise you. First and foremost, because you are worthy. You are God. You didn't have to do anything. You didn't have to do anything for us, but God, we are so glad that you did. You didn't have to come but we are so glad that you came. God, we too want to be overwhelmed with joy. We too want to experience you and nothing else, God. To experience you, to know you, to see you. To be with you is enough. God, we pray that this Christmas season, as we head into a new year, that you would be enough for us. There's certainly a lot of stuff. 
a lot of circumstances that pull our focus. Other things that happen, God, that distract us. We try and make this life about so many other things. Our lives become ruled by other things. We become enslaved to other things, but God, you came to set us free. You came to bring joy to the world. You came to bring peace and love and hope. May we experience those things as we worship you. Help us to choose daily to submit, to not be indifferent, to not fight you on it, God, but to bow down, to give you control of every situation, every moment. You, God, are worthy. Help us to see just how much we need you every hour, every day. Fill us, Holy Spirit, with your presence and your power that we might declare these truths to the world that you, God, loved us that you came. Break down any walls preventing us from coming to you, keeping us from worshiping you. And may you receive all the praise and all the glory, both now and forever. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.